Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today I want to talk really briefly about something that is going to be kind of interesting, and that is, why are all servers not four socket servers? At first, you know, you say, well, of course they cost more, but there are actually some technical reasons why four socket servers of today are not necessarily the solution that everybody wants to use. Of course, they're the more obvious ones, such as the fact that the servers cost more. So if you only need a single socket server, four socket servers way overkill. But we still want to talk about some of the technical reasons and some of the economic reasons that we either should use four socket servers or maybe we shouldn't. Okay, so probably one of the most awesome things about a four socket server is the fact that you have four sockets per node, which means for a scale up application, you have more resources without having to go outside of a box. That's great. It also means that anything that is per node license is actually less expensive because you have fewer nodes because instead of using two socket servers or two two socket servers, you're using one four socket server. So per node licensing actually is, makes a lot of sense. Another great feature is that you get more expansion per node. So in modern servers, what you see, like say the second generation Intel Xeon Scalable, servers, you see that each CPU, you get 48 PCIe lanes per CPU. So when you go from two CPUs to four CPUs, you get an extra 96 lanes in a single box. If you want to go build a giant storage array or, you know, you need something where you need a lot of PCIe lanes, then the four socket server actually makes sense. And there are some hyperscalers that are actually taking a four socket server, hanging GPUs off of each of the sockets and saying, well, you know, we just need CPU and memory to GPU traffic, and that's all we really care about. So four socket server is great because that helps us consolidate. So, you know, this is definitely a model that people are taking advantage of this extra expansion capability. And let's talk cost savings for a second. Now, there are a lot of servers out there that can really realistically get away with one NIC per node. And that means, you know, you need fewer NICs. It means you, you need fewer switch ports. I mean, there are a lot of cost savings just on the network side alone. There are also things such as licenses that you pay on each node. So if you have a BMC, let's say you need an iDRAC license for a Dell server, or you need an HPE ILO license, something like that. Those are all managed on a per node basis. So you have half of the nodes by going to four socket versus two socket. That's actually a pretty nice cost savings. There are other bits in the chassis. You only need one chassis. You only need say two power supplies instead of four power supplies. There are a lot of chassis level areas where it's you know less expensive. You get things like you need fewer boot drives. You need fewer BMC management chips on the actual motherboard itself. I mean, there are a lot of cost optimization areas that you get with a four socket server. Another really good example on the Intel Xeon side is that you only need one PCH for a four socket server. Now, you know, on the Epic side, they don't actually use PCHs, but for Xeon, yeah, you need it. So you get only one of these things instead of two and, you know, you save a little bit of motherboard cost. So if you actually look at the systems themselves, we did a review of two servers a little while ago. One was a two socket server, one was a four socket server. They were pretty much the same super micro ultra platform, but the Delta was like $1,700 for the bare bones for the two socket. And it was, I think like $2,700 for the four socket server. So it wasn't really that much more. And you know, you're definitely seeing these cost savings flow through from bomb costs into final server costs. There's some operational benefits as well. So for example, when you're running the four socket servers, you get a little bit better power efficiency on the power supplies. So your TCO goes down just a little bit because of the power and ongoing cost there. There are also some kind of really interesting use cases. Like for example, there were some Chinese hyperscalers that said, hey, we're gonna deploy four socket servers because you know we'll put two in them to start out. And then when we wanna get more power, we'll just put four, we'll put, we'll add extra memory and boom, we don't need to go buy new servers. And that's actually kind of a cool way to think about it. By the way, we're gonna talk about the Chinese version of four socket servers and why that's an interesting market a little bit later as well. Okay, let's talk a little bit about why we don't use four socket servers because that's probably the more exciting discussion. The first thing is cost. Now, most licensing is done nowadays on a per core basis. VMware just switched, so you can check out our license again, piece on that. But you know, when you're being metered in terms of, and, and you have to pay for, for your license based on per cores, you want the highest per core performance. You don't necessarily need the largest scale up performance. And performance is actually a very interesting subject with four socket servers. So if you have, and we're just gonna use the current generation Intel Xeon Scalable as an example, 
If you have a gold 6200 or a platinum 8200 SKU, you get basically three UPI links. And these UPI links, you can think of them as they're kind of point to point links between each of the CPUs in the system. Now in a dual socket server, because you have three links, you can actually put those three links and connect each of the two CPUs via three links to each other and get a lot of bandwidth between the two sockets. When you go instead to a four socket model, well, things change a little bit. So each CPU has to talk to three other CPUs and you have three UPI links, which means that you get one link between each CPU. Or that also means that you get about a third of the bandwidth of like a higher end dual socket server. There are dual socket servers, I'm just gonna mention this here. There are dual socket servers that only use two UPI links between the sockets. And that's really a cost optimization area. And that's just something that, you know, some of the server guys do because it's a lower power. It costs less for the motherboard. And so you do have to kind of look at that in performance. But even, even in that case, you're still only getting half the bandwidth with one link across versus two. So either way, you're getting less socket to socket performance in four socket than you do in two socket. That's a big deal. When you have to do things like you have to move data from one socket to another, you have high-end GPUs, you have storage, you have you know high-end networking, whatever it is, and you have to start moving a lot of data between CPUs, having only one UPI link is actually kind of a big bottleneck. Now, Intel doesn't necessarily help the case all the time, because if you go look into something like the Gold 5200 series, what you see is that there's only two UPI links per CPU. And if you think about it, if you have a four socket server and they can work in four socket servers, but if you have a four socket server and you can only talk to two of your neighbors instead of all three, that means that there are gonna be NUMA nodes that are two hops away, not just one. That further constrains bandwidth and it's just really tough on a system, which is why you don't really see that many four socket servers deployed with gold 5200 CPUs. And as a quick analogy, because a lot of this computer stuff and the way people design things, kind of gets reused and the same concepts get reused through different domains. If you actually go look at how the NVIDIA Tesla P100 was and how many links it had versus the Tesla V100 in the SXM2 form factor, what you're gonna see is that the Tesla V100 looked kind of more like a three UPI link Xeon server and the Tesla P100 looked like a two UPI link Xeon 5200 server. So when you kind of look at it, it's actually kind of cool to, to see the same concepts and the same benefits are being shown throughout different domains in the computer architecture. And just to kind of round out some of the other bits, the AMD Epic chips currently don't do four socket. The Platinum 9200 series are basically a four socket server in two packages, sockets, I don't know exactly how you'd call that, but that's already kind of like a four socket thing. The Intel Xeon Silver and Intel Xeon Bronze can't do four socket, they can only do two socket. That makes sense, they're lower and you know, kind of cost optimized SKUs. So putting them into a four socket server kind of doesn't make sense, but that just kind of gives you some idea in terms of, you know, there are only parts of the portfolio where really going four socket makes sense. Now on the density standpoint, you really don't get that much. I mean, even if you had a one U and most of the four socket servers are actually two U, but even a one U four socket server is only as dense as a two U four node server in terms of number of cores. Now, of course, you get more memory and that kind of makes sense. But at the same time, you're not really getting more density because you've gone to four socket. You might even actually be getting a little bit less density. From a complexity standpoint, it's actually harder to make a four socket motherboard than it is to make a two socket motherboard. They cost a little bit more because you have more connections that you're trying to place. And so that's another reason that it's a little bit harder and you don't actually see all vendors come out with four socket solutions, whereas you know there are a ton of vendors with two socket solutions. Another disadvantage of four socket servers is frankly boot times. You have so much memory, it takes so long to initialize. A lot of times it takes literally minutes for a four socket server to initialize. I mean, we had one with like six terabytes of DCPMM memory plus kind of standard DDR4 memory. And that thing took like 15 plus minutes to even post. If you plugged in, you know, a cable into the back to the VGA, it literally was black for like 15 minutes. At that point, you could almost use a sundial to clock and time the boot time. These boot times are like the biggest reason that we don't use four socket servers in the STH hosting infrastructure. Okay, so now for one of the most fun ones for a lot of people, and that's the fact that in China, four is an unlucky number. Turns out that the words kind of are somewhat similar to when you pronounce the word for four and you pronounce the word for death, they're actually you know very similar except for the intonation and how you pronounce the word. 
I had a couple people explain and try getting me to pronounce the Mandarin for both of them. I'm not going to do that on video because I'm going to mess it up if I try. And if you think about it, it's kind of the same idea. Like, you know, if you go to a building in Asia, a lot of times you don't see a fourth floor and same kind of idea in the US. If you go to a building, you don't see a 13th floor. If you go on a US airline, you don't see a 13th row on the airline because, you know, people are superstitious. And apparently that works in terms of when we build things, when we fly on things and even our servers. And then there's a really interesting little nugget. We actually heard this from a fairly large server OEM. We confirmed it with Intel as well. It turns out that the largest market apparently for eight socket servers is actually in China because in China, eight is a lucky number. And you know, you kind of look at the US equivalent, seven would be a lucky number, but seven doesn't really fit as well because it's an odd number into computer architectures. But if you have eight, lo and behold, the Xeon Platinum 8200 series can go into eight socket servers. Now, some people might be really excited about the AMD Epic saying like, hey, AMD doesn't do four socket servers they used to, and they used to be very big on four socket servers back in the Optron days. But, you know, some people are going to say, hey, it's the AMD Epic, you know, getting a whole bunch of cores into a two socket system. That means you don't need four sockets. You know, AMD actually used to be really big in the Optron days on four sockets. The Optron 6000 series was awesome in four socket. We actually did reviews of that way back like 10 years ago. Still, that's not the reason that people don't use four socket servers. Epic is not the primary reason. Okay, there are plenty of applications. We're having four socket servers where you can scale up, have more cores, more memory, all working on the same problem is great. You have things like in-memory analytics and databases that absolutely are really cool when you can get bigger, fatter nodes. You also can use things like Intel Optane DC PMM and L series processors and use a ton of memory in these systems, which kind of unlocks a completely new class of computing that you just can't do in two socket servers. Still, there's some areas where deploying four socket servers can make a lot of sense. Like, for example, if you're deploying a whole bunch of dual socket servers, you know, consolidating down to four socket servers, if you don't really have a lot of network requirements or something like that, can make sense because you're lowering the cost of each node by a couple thousand dollars per, which adds up. Other negatives of the four socket include this whole UPI and NUMA configuration thing. And we kind of went into that, but that's a big reason. And that's probably one of the biggest reasons that the mass market hasn't adopted four socket servers. Still, if you're aware of the pros and cons of four socket servers, they might be something to look into because at the end of the day, there are benefits to having bigger, fatter pools. If you have virtualization, being able to have a bigger pool of memory, have a bigger pool of cores, allows you to do more over subscription and better utilize resources. If you're aware of the pros and cons of the four socket and two socket servers, you know, they can either make sense, not make sense, but we're going to have reviews of both of them on the STH main site. So while you're here, why don't you check out the STH main site? You can also subscribe to us on YouTube. You can check out some of the other videos we have on YouTube. And overall, you know, we're creating a lot of content, so you should definitely check back often. Thanks again for watching and have an awesome day.